Welcome everyone to the Geneva Historical Society's History Sandwich Inn. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Hopefully some of you have uh, are having your lunch while, while we're doing the program. Uh, my name is Carrie Lippincott and I'm the, the Executive Director of the Historical Society. Many of you um, by now are probably familiar with uh, how Zoom works, but I'm just going to give a brief overview. So if you haven't already, I'm going to ask you that you please mute um, your microphone, and you can do that by going to the lower left-hand corner of your screen, and you're going to see a little microphone. So if you just want to click that on. The other thing is if you have any questions during the program, we're going to ask that you put it in the chat box. And the, and the chat box will be monitored um, throughout the program. So if you have any questions, um, they'll be taken care of. So just a little bit about the format today. Uh, John Marks, our curator, is going to share uh, legends and lores, and he's going to share um, some slides. And then when he gets done sharing the slides, we're going to open it up for our, anybody that has their own legends or lore uh, that they'd like to share that, that, that perhaps wasn't covered uh, during his presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to turn everything over to John. All right. Thanks, Carrie. Um, this is new for me. I have sat in on many, many Zoom meetings. Uh, this spring and summer, but this is the first time I've really presented. My wife says I'm a big ham. I like to see people and be able to chat before I get started and see people's uh, reactions to what I'm talking about. But I have five legends uh, on the PowerPoint, and I'm going to go through those. And as Carrie said, at the end, we'll open it up for discussion. I think there's a few that maybe you all have heard that you want to talk about, and maybe there's some that I haven't heard about. So I'm going to start out with one. Oh, I should say, uh, this is pretty informal. I'm gonna state the legend and then uh, talk about the truth, if there is any to be had. And uh, then I have a few stories related to the legend because legends aren't a thing unto themselves. They, uh, uh, they pick up steam as they roll along through the years. So I'm gonna start off with a, a really obvious one, one we get uh, all the time at the museum. Geneva is named after Geneva, Switzerland. So this is a map from 1771, zooming in on um, Seneca Lake. And so as um, many of you may know, uh, the uh, Seneca Nation here up to 1779 was Canada Saga. Here they have spelled it um, Canada Sagi. And uh, Canandaigua was uh, Canadarqua, Canadarqua, I think. And they have pretty much kept their name, but we have not. So some of the some of the legends about how we became Geneva. Uh, there was a European traveler passing through and said, oh, it's just like Switzerland. Um, it was a Swiss engineer working for Charles Williamson who said it looks just like Switzerland. It was any number of people who came here and said this looks just like Geneva, Switzerland. Um, the, the problem with that second theory with Charles Williamson is he was not even here until uh, 1791 or 1792. So um, I think in this case, the truth may be um, what you choose to believe. Uh, spoiler alert, I don't have a definitive answer. Um, some people may feel they do, but I kind of lean more towards um, we're still not sure. Uh, in August 8th of 1788, Hugh Maxwell was surveying the preemption line and which is a whole nother story for another history lunch sometime. Um, and he wrote that uh, on August 8th, he stopped in Canada Saga. So uh, in August of 1788, it was still Canada Saga. According to John uh, George Conover, a county historian in um, the 19th century, uh, he says there's a number of documents which I have not seen there are a number of documents yet in existence bearing date October and November 1788 in which the name of Geneva is used. The, um, and uh, two of these papers are Dr. Kayla Benton letters from October 15th and November 7th, 1788. So that's just a few, uh, few short months later. And here's a map from uh, 1794 where you can see Quite obviously, it's Geneva. Canandaqua is still called uh, Canandarqua, which is how my dad used to call it because he was a history buff. Um, but um, 
here apparently just in a few short months from Hugh Maxwell to uh, Caleb Benton, it became Geneva. Um, without actually reading these letters myself, it still begs the question, why did they come up with Geneva? Um, I don't know if uh, they were just sitting around one night and decided that they were tired of saying Canada saga, they wanted something shorter. Um, you know, there may be something to this ritual in theory, although it's not somebody who's actually from there, I don't believe. Uh, I don't know that we'll ever really know. Uh, one theory that somebody uh, uh, brought up to me, which I don't think is any worse than other, any other theory, is uh, Seneca and uh, the words Seneca and Geneva have four common letters. And this individual thought that they looked at Seneca Lake on the map, and um, particularly in uh, 1700s script, that the S and the C looked like a G and a V. So they decided it was Geneva. I I don't know. It's it's really it's really hard to say. But that's that's one theory that's out there. Um, my stock answer at the museum is that we don't really know. Uh, and then if they're interested in the longer story, I share it with them. Um, one story, because of our uh, supposed resemblance to Switzerland, is this, this is actual Geneva, Switzerland, with their uh, jet at the end of their uh, jetty. Uh, it goes uh, over 450 feet up in the air, and it's a very distinguishing feature of Switzerland, uh, Geneva. And uh, in 1958, Mayor Fred Warder, um, he was ahead of his time. He really thought we needed to begin promoting tourism in Geneva. Uh, and in 1958, he thought we needed uh, a fountain like this. And at that point, we had the Long Pier, and then separate from that, a little further out into the harbor was uh, Lighthouse Pier. And he thought Lighthouse Pier would be a great place to put a uh, jet d'eau. Um, over the course of a year, he raised between four and five thousand um, dollars, but it was far short of the goal. And city council was unenthusiastic. Um, and I think the idea still pops up from time to time. I think there was a, a individual here who's been talking about it over the last year or two, and maybe even soliciting donations. Uh, I'm not sure. So uh, who knows? Maybe someday we will have a uh, we will have a fountain out there. And just point of interest uh, that you may not know, there are 23 Genevas in the United States. Um, I was aware of Ohio and Illinois, and recently we've gotten Geneva, Alabama. And the phone calls, people looking for research always begin, uh, well, not always, but they often begin with a street or a place name that's uh, similar, sim similar to our city. So I play along and then suddenly they start talking about something that's very unfamiliar. And that's when I have to interject and say, um, this is Geneva, New York. Which Geneva are you looking for? So um, we are, we're unique in some ways, but not in others. And particularly the Midwest Genevas uh, were probably named by people who uh, moved west in the uh, early 19th century after living here. So the next one is uh, Seneca, Seneca Lake never freezes. And I should qualify that by saying a freeze is end to end from Watkins Glen to, to Geneva. Uh, the north and south ends will freeze and some of the protected bays, you can see uh, you know, quite a few of the points here and uh, Long Point down here and some of these other areas. Depending on the winter, winter if it's uh, at all cold, those uh, areas certainly do freeze. But uh, end to end, uh, it's said that the lake never freezes. Uh, the truth is that four times in recorded history, um, referring to probably post 1790s, um, it's frozen four times, 1855, 1875, 1885, and the last time was in 1912. Um, so it has, but not very often. Um, the depth of the lake is 634 feet, so probably it hasn't frozen many more times uh, pre-1790. Um, so it's pretty, um, it's pretty, it's pretty definite that it does not freeze very often. Uh, 
perhaps the real legend here is, and I've heard this, I don't know if this is true or not, um, but I've heard that back in the 1940s and 50s when Samson was active as a uh, naval training station and then an Air Force base, um, the locals would tell some of the outer staters, particularly if they were from the South, oh, you know, winter, winter time, you need to put lake water in your radiator because Seneca Lake never freezes. <laughs> I don't know if that's entirely true. I don't know if it ever happened. Um, it would, you know, it's a pretty mean thing to do, but that is one of the legends that has uh, sprung up uh, about that. And uh, Samson has its own set of set of lore. Um, one of the interesting things I've found with uh, reading the uh, veterans newsletters from both the Air Force and the Naval Station, no one was ever here in the summer. Every single uh, veteran who writes into the paper talks about it being the, uh, the worst winter of his life. Oh my gosh, it was so cold. Um, it doesn't seem like they ever had recruits here in uh, July or August talking about how beautiful the lake was or you know, how nice it was at night. You know, everyone was here in the winter, I guess. So this is, this is a fun one. Oh, and I, I forgot I had this. This is from the last time the lake froze uh, in uh, 1912. And this was when the, the Long Pier uh, still had both uh, boat houses on the Geneva side of the harbor. And you can see with all the uh, waves splashing up there, particularly the, the house closest to shore, uh, just caked in ice there. Yeah, I forgot the slides that I had here. So of course, this is uh, World War II, the, uh, uh, the Samson boots or recruits out in their, um, uh, out in their lifeboats practicing. All right, now we're caught up. So this seems to be particular to HWS. I don't know if anyone locally has ever heard this legend outside of uh, college faculty and students. Um, it's, uh, they refer to it as the Lady of the Lake and the Lady of the Lake burns down any buildings. There is her fierce stare, um, uh, properly masked for the, uh, uh, for the times. Um, her fierce stare burns down any buildings that block her view of the lake. And so uh, she's, for folks who may be from out of town, uh, she sits on South Main Street uh, in Pulteney Park and faces the lake. And you can see here that there's nothing in front of her. So uh, the truth is, um, this is a statue called Peace. And it was uh, created and dedicated in 1939. The sculptor was Jean McKay. And uh, it was dedicated as a war memorial to all Genevans who served in wars up to that point, which is ironic considering what was going on in 1939. Um, classic, uh, classic iconography with uh, uh, down on one knee and the sword is pointed into the ground in a peaceful, uh, peaceful gesture. So behind her is Washington Street, and ahead of her, until probably the late 1960s, was East Washington Street. So uh, this is South Main Street. Uh, the park is right about here. And as you can see, right down um, in, in the midst of her destructive gaze is East Washington Street that used to come all the way down to Seneca Lake. And uh, in 1920, 68 or 66, uh, urban renewal program in G Geneva, the federally funded program, um, took out all these houses uh, around here and uh, this became a parking lot. And now over here is now the Geneva Recreation Center uh, ice rink. Um, I tell, uh, when, when I'm walking around with students and we're standing there, I said, okay, look behind you, now turn around, it's like, you should be able to tell it's just a continuation uh, of the street. I mentioned there's many Genevans who were born after the 1960s who may not you know, be aware that there used to be a street there. So it's not too surprising. Keep my cat off the camera. Um, 
what's interesting is the reactions of uh, HWS students when I tell them. I had an intern a number of years ago and I told her and she was, she couldn't really believe it. But she came in one Monday and said, I was at a party this weekend and I told my friends about the Lady of the Lake and they looked like I had told them Santa Claus wasn't real. Like, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> they were so disappointed. Um, I've also had students tell me that they've heard from certain professors. Oh, Professor so-and-so, shall we name nameless, told me about this. I'm like, okay, I need to have a conversation with them. Um, another interesting side fact is that um, after Jean McKay uh, designed the statue and made, made the model, it was sent off to be uh, to be carved in Georgia, and they sent it up to us, and it was rejected because it had some uh, unsightly flaws in the stone, and so it was sent away, and apparently it ended up in the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina, and I cannot remember exactly what town. I want to say it's over maybe south of Asheville, but I am not sure, and uh, there, it's been called Pocahontas. So uh, uh, I do, if, for anyone who's interested, I think we do have the article on file. It was kind of one of those uh, happenstance circumstances. Someone in North Carolina had a relative in Geneva and said, hey, you know, here's this article, because it did trace the whole history that it was originally intended uh, for Geneva, New York. So one of my favorites, and I have to admit, I'm pretty fond of the Lady of the Lake story. The white deer at Seneca Army Depot are mutants as a result of radiation from nuclear weapons. Um, I, I, I heard this growing up. I grew up over in Penyan, uh, so I heard a lot of these, and it's like, yeah, you know, the government says they don't have nukes there, but you see those white deers, you know, there's something wrong with them. Um, so uh, the truth, um, obviously it was um, built in uh, 1940, 1941. Um, they were storing a lot of new munitions for World War II. So obviously they were going to uh, put security fencing around the entire perimeter. And this was the original uh, uh, village called Kendaya, which is World War II is a whole nother, yet another uh, history lunch we could do sometime. Uh, the government took over the entire village and uh, everyone moved out and they turned it into uh, the uh, turned it into munition storage and as you can see here uh, uh, these are these are all the bunkers that are kept a certain number of feet apart in case one of them ever exploded um, as a side story my great uncle uh, from the Binghamton area came over and was working on uh, constructing the depot and Samson Naval Training Station, and it just tore him up. He says, you know, he said to my great, uh, he said to my grandfather, he said, they got such great soil over there, and they're just, you know, sticking bombs in the ground. He says, it just breaks my heart, because over where they lived, the soil was not that great. So um, I had that story passed, passed down to me. So in 1941, they throw up a uh, security around the entire perimeter uh, and whatever deer and other wildlife were there uh, stayed in because obviously it was a high fence with uh, you know protective wire and razor wire at the top so um, you've got all these deer that are now um, uh, now in there um, these are uh, not albino deers uh, deer I'm sorry um, White-tailed deers have a recessive gene for white fur, uh, still have brown eyes, it's not albinism. Um, so once they're all in there uh, interbreeding, um, today about a quarter of the deer population uh, have white fur. So it's just something that happened uh, naturally. You don't see it very often because not only is it a recessive gene trait, um, a white deer is not gonna live long in the wild. Uh, I think periodically one or two have gotten out and they don't last long. Uh, they have no camouflage. Um, and they have been uh, protected over time. Initially, um, as the deer population got larger, 
uh, uh, some hunting was allowed, but they said don't shoot the white ones. Um, so that has kind of preserved them. And I think it's one of the largest uh, white deer herds in the world now. Um, more truth to this rumor, particularly the radioactive part, um, the official Department of Defense stance has always been uh, neither confirm nor, de nor deny the existence of nuclear weapons at Seneca Army Depot. And if you remember back in 1983, 84, uh, the Women's Peace Encampment and the Nuclear Freeze Movement, um, that statement appeared almost every day in the Finger Lakes Times. Uh, you know, the Army will neither confirm nor deny. So um, since the depot was decommissioned, I think in the 1990s, um, you know, they still haven't changed their stance, but obviously some facts have come to light. Um, radioactivity being one of them, uh, the fact that they've had to remove a lot of soil and, you know, fill up certain places with concrete and uh, seal it off. Um, information has been declassified and people have been able to talk about their experience there. Um, they, um, either in the 50s or 60s, they, uh, well, no, actually earlier than that, they created Area Q, which is a designation. Uh, I think there were 19 different places that had uh, Area Q designation uh, in the country. And that's the highest security level. So Area Q had uh, 64 igloos uh, in one uh, square mile area. So just like these, but they were um, all, all clustered together. Uh, some of them uh, were rated uh, atomic blast resistant. Um, this square, uh, one square mile area had three fences. One of them uh, had almost 5,000 volts of electricity. Um, I don't know if they told you which fence had it or not, but there were concentric fences. So you had to pass through uh, these three fences. Um, you had to be uh, escorted by a guard. Um, if you were foolish enough to try to uh, go in without security and an armed guard, once you got past the three fences, there was a special security force that was um, patrolling every, every hour of the day, 365 days. Uh, they had FBI clearance and 50 caliber auto machine guns and shoot to kill orders. But wait, there's more. Um, the igloos were equipped with gas systems in case somebody uh, somebody got past all that and actually breached one of the doors. Um, tear gas, cyanide, possibly some other nerve agent, which was not classified. So they could remotely trigger that if they got an alarm, somebody was in the igloo, was not supposed to be there, um, they, would, uh, they would trip the system. So given all this information, they probably weren't guarding the nation's strategic reserve of gummy bears. Uh, it's pretty obvious they were uh, uh, guarding nuclear weapons. And even in the 40s during the war, um, again, after it was uh, declassified, uh, locals who worked there said that they, um, you know, they remember uh, loading up or supervising the loading of these you know, strange barrels full of black stuff and what, whatnot. And it was uh, uranium and pitch blend and other things that went into um, you know, making the bombs that were uh, sent off to the laboratories. So my personal story, and I have to admit this was before I knew the real story. Uh, I moved back here in 2000 with my wife from North Carolina. And one evening we were driving to Trumansburg for dinner and we got near the depot fence and I thought, okay, I gotta, I gotta tell this story. I'm like, yeah, you know, they got white deer in there. They're, they're radioactive. They're a bunch of mutants. And she's like, you are so full of, oh my God, there's one. There's a white deer. <laughs> oh, so that was fun. That was perfect timing. Um, and my, uh, uh, and some of my uh, in-laws from uh, North Carolina, who may be on here right now, uh, love to come up and see the white deer. Uh, sometimes they make, sometimes the deer come out, and sometimes they don't. And I forgot there. If you haven't been lucky enough to see them, there they are with their, uh, with one of their brown deer brother or sisters.
this is another question I seem to get more from um, college related folk, although not exclusively. And there are variations on a theme for this legend. Are there nuclear subs in Seneca Lake? Do they test nuclear subs in Seneca Lake? Did one get lost in Seneca Lake? Um, no. Uh, like many rumors, there may be, it may have started one way and gone off in other directions. Uh, the partial truth is that there, since 1962, there is a naval research barge uh, anchored off of Dresden. It's about a little over a mile from the western shore. Um, if you're coming from Penn Yan, as I did as a, a young child, you come down um, Route 54 towards the lake, and then you head north on Route 14. Or uh, if you're over in Seneca, Seneca County, excuse me, over by Ovid, same thing. You know, you're coming down the coming down the road, and you see this big thing anchored out in the middle of the lake. Really, until I found this photo um, last week, I always thought it was a ship. I always thought it was one large ship. I had never seen anything, uh, you know, like this close-up view. In fact, it's several barges that are um, permanently anchored out there. So it is, um, it is officially called the Seneca Lake Sonar Test Facility, and it is a field station of the Naval Sea Systems Command. Um, and they came up with this in 1962, and by 1964, they had run a power line from, uh, from Wong Point out there. And their work is classified, but their you know, publicity about it is not. You can, um, you can Google it as I did and find out a lot of information. Um, all the facilities that they have on the barge, because once you get over there, you're pretty much there for the day. Um, I enjoyed their advice was bring safety equipment and pack a lunch. Uh, so uh, they have a they have a galley on the uh, on the barge. Um, as I mentioned previously, uh, the lake is 634 feet deep, which makes it ideal for testing. Um, sea testing is uh, much uh, much more unpredictable, and you're you know you're dealing with all kinds of problems like high seas and whatnot. Um, Seneca Lake has uh, also has a uniform temperature, especially in the winter uh, from, from top to bottom. So it's all very controlled. Uh, as, as you can see here, uh, they've got these huge towers. Uh, they, can, um, uh, they, they can hoist and uh, hoist and lower um, huge amounts of weight, just hundreds of tons of uh, equipment. Um, in some cases, so what they're testing is sonar array. They're not actually testing the submarine. They're testing the uh, they're testing the front part of the uh, of the submarine and other uh, equipment as well. Um, sometimes they have uh, things as large as a one car garage that they're that they're dropping in there. Um, they uh, they do work for the Navy, but they are also available for um, other agencies of the government, uh, universities, foreign governments and private industry. So anyone who is testing any kind of uh, underwater sonar equipment for whatever reason um, is welcome to uh, come out and uh, use the facility. As I said, it's not top secret, but it is classified. Um, obviously, many of these people, uh, you know, universities protect their research and certainly private industry is uh, protecting their research as well. So I have heard, um, and again, this is part of the legend, uh, particularly like during the, particularly during the uh, uh, Seneca Trout Derby in May, uh, fishermen get a little bit too close, and they said the Zodiac boats with the uh, the guys with the machine guns, machine guns come zipping out and telling you got to get away from here. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. It could be for security. Uh, but the website also says that sometimes for testing purposes, if they are, um, you know, they're doing particularly sensitive tests uh, and they don't want interference within a half mile 
up the barge or whatnot. They will uh, keep recreational boaters away. So that may be where some of the nuclear sub rumors came from. Um, partial truth, and, and again, partial truth, part, partial legend. Legend. Um, I've heard that um, mini subs have been brought in before, uh, particularly to search for human remains. Um, when someone drowns, uh, there are a lot of underwater ledges and debris and other things. And I've, I, I believe I've heard that concerned family members uh, have, uh, have brought in, you know, small subs to, uh, uh, to try to uh, find the remains. Um, but then there is always April Fools. <laughs> and with the birth of the internet, sometimes it's just a fool for any day. Um, I was just Googling on this and um, it popped up on a, um, on a local chat group. And I saw the picture in the first, you know, there's something about, um, this was actually supposed to be on Cayuga Lake and Russian expatriate so-and-so living in Ithaca now, looked out his window and saw a, something something Russian submarine. Uh, and of course, the first thing I did was check the date. It was April 1st, 2016. Um, but this still pops up. But then in the comments below that, uh, people started running with it and saying, yeah, well, actually, they, there's an underwater tunnel that um, follows the route of the Erie Canal. That's how they get the subs in. You know, they don't want to take it through the canal, so there's an underwater tunnel. And you know, people keep going, and then somebody says, is this real? You know, oh yeah, yeah, it's definitely real. Um, uh, and then of course, you know, this day and age, conspiracy theories. You know, they say they're testing sonar equipment at uh, Dresden, but you know, that's not really what they're doing. Um, and a story related to this, and uh, Anne may remember, um, the Finger Lakes area hired some tourism consultants to come out and go throughout the area and give their impressions of tourism and the Finger Lakes and how we could improve things. This was maybe about 15 years ago. And we were reading the report for the Geneva area and said, well, we were traveling north from Watkins Glen. And there's uh, an interesting ship out in the lake. And you really need some uh, tourism signage. People need to know what that is. You really need to explain better what that is out there. Um, and of course, our humorous response was, you know, if they tell you, they'll have to kill you. Um, <laughs> which, of course, is a gross over-exaggeration. But, um, it, you know, it, they, uh, you know, they're, they're out there for a reason. And they don't really feel they need to share much more than that. So I have been, whew, I have been yapping for about uh, 30 minutes there. Oh, uh, what are some legends that you have heard? Folks, um, let, me, let, me, let me go to yeah. gallery view Can here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, hi, Joyce. Hi, hi. Hi, everybody. Um, two, two that I, one was that, that you mentioned the surveyor that came through doing preemption road that he named all these local towns using Latin references to ancient Rome or Latin like Syracuse, Marcellus, Interlaken, Ovid, Geneva, yada yada, uh, and so on. Is there any truth to that? Um, Anne may know better than I. We had a speaker a number of years ago named William Farrell, and he had written a book about classical place names in, uh, uh, in New York, particularly Western New York. And I looked at that book this morning, and that it was it was there that I found this reference to uh, Caleb Benton. I think he called him Dr. Caleb Brown, but he had the basic information right. Um, he he did, and I'm I'm forgetting it was a Secretary of State for uh, uh, for New York, and I forget the man's name, but he was uh, he did love the classics, and that's why we have. Uh, Cato and Romulus and Ovid and Ithaca and Syracuse, yep. uh, but he, um, 1788 was before his time, so he was not um, involved in naming okay. us Geneva. Okay, second thing, <laughs> and this could, this is total rumor. 
I have a cousin who grew up in Geneva, swears he saw a UFO come out of the lake. And I'm, I'm sure there's UFO rumors out there. Have, have you run across any of those? Uh, may, uh, may I ask when this was? What, a decade? Or well, no? it would have been, gosh, in the late 40s, 50s, maybe. He, he was a good 20 years older than me, so. Um, it's, it's probably coming out of Samson then. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Probably what they were, that's what they were hiding behind the fence yeah. over there. Yeah, and he could have been pulling my leg too, but he, that's, that's the fun about, he was quite serious about it. That's the fun part about all of this. So you've never heard that rumor before that there are you. I've not. Okay. <laughs> Hiding in the depths. All right. That, that, those are my two uh, legends have, or lore. I have a few more up my sleeve, but I don't know if anyone else had uh, uh, questions or ones that they have heard before. Well, I'll spend a few more here. Um, Bellhurst, Bellhurst Castle uh, on the south edge of the city uh, is uh, home to a, a number of stories and legends. And uh, one gentleman, Mr. David Sackmeister, wrote a book uh, a few years ago about this. Um, and it actually began because uh, he was a guest at uh, Bellhurst, and I think he was up on my my cat is raising a ruckus. Um, he was he was a guest at Bellhurst up on the third floor, and he woke up in the middle of the night and looked out and saw a lady in white uh, walking across the lawn. Uh, and so he began investigating this. Um, and supposedly there was an opera singer and a Spanish Don who were living on the property of Bellhurst, you know, long, long before uh, the castle was there. In fact, you know, maybe even prior to uh, 1790 kind of story. And, um, and, and part of it was that they were, you know, hiding from her, uh, hiding from her husband or hiding from a lover or something and they had a tunnel to the lake in case they needed to escape and of course you know this person came after them and they got in the tunnel and it collapsed on them um this was pitched as an early new york folk tale in the 1936 book listen for a lonesome drum by carl carmer um no one else has ever come up with this story before no one has really uh, uh, verified it or talked about it uh, it's particularly interesting that it happened so early um, you know, 1780s or so, and uh, the uh, the Seneca Nation didn't leave this area until 1779 uh, during the Revolution. So, you know, pretty suspect. Um, of course, another legend, uh, much more recent, um, less than 100 years. Uh, Bellhurst was a speakeasy, and and a casino. Um, this is probably this is mostly true. Um, a gentleman named Red Dwyer uh, bought the uh, bought the property and opened it in March of 1933. And part of the legend is that cat cat uh, zoom bombing. Uh, part of the legend is that he was uh, running uh, whiskey and uh, good liquor down from Canada using the canal system, and uh, they'd come down in boats. And it would uh, the boats would come up to uh, the shoreline underneath uh, Bellhurst, and then there was kind of a little secret path that they could uh, bring the liquor up to the castle. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, it's not entirely false because he started it in March of 1933, and uh, prohibition ended December 5th of 1933. Um, the casino lasted much longer, I think, into the 1950s. And in fact, I uh, I had a neighbor in Penn Yan who uh, used to go there. She uh, uh, she remembers, you know, uh, go, going up to the door and knocking to knocking to be let in. But it was also um, a restaurant and a and a nightclub as well. John, there is a question: um, Is the barge man man twenty four seven? Um. 
I do not know. I'm, I imagine there, uh, I'm just going to guess that somebody is out there um, because they do have a lot of, um, what was interesting to me was reading about all the facilities, you know, they are testing things people bring in, but they have instrumentation and um, basically machine shops, tool shops, anything you need. So if you get there and you need to make, um, you, need, you need to make some uh, changes or repairs to what you've brought, uh, they've got a huge machine shop that you can do the work right there. So I would imagine just for security reasons that they have somebody out there. Um, uh, tunnel between the lakes, that's one that we get an awful lot. Um, in fact, I had a woman last month call up and ask if uh, it was true there was a uh, tunnel between uh, Canandaigua Lake and uh, Seneca Lake. And I said, well, if you look at the map, that's an awful long way. Uh, so I don't think so. Um, I have heard, I think I've heard that about uh, Cuca and Seneca Lake. I may have heard that about um, Seneca and Cayuga Lake. Um, I flipped through some books. Uh, Carol Sessler from Ithaca wrote uh, good books on Cayuga and Seneca Lakes, and I didn't see that she addressed that. So um, it's hard to say. I will say with all the scientific research that's gone on through HWS and other folks, um, I think they're, uh, I think they probably would have discovered something by now. Okay. Joyce, Joyce, did you have a, que a question? Not a question. Oh. This, is, this is just a family story about prohibition going back to the Bellhurst rumor or the Bellhurst. My grandfather uh, lived in Manchester and he claimed during the prohibition, you know, um, sealed railroad cars would come through the railroad yard with uh, Kentucky bourbon and whiskey headed to Canada. And the guys would go and drill up under the railroad cars and empty the barrels <laughs> for local consumption <laughs> during prohibition. And he, he, he you know, I, I, I think probably that might have happened a few times. <laughs> I, um, Talking I, I about had, prohibition uh, made me think of that. He used to tell that story all the time. I've had Hobart and William Smith kids um, uh, come in to do research, you know, because it, it's obviously a fascinating topic. So they would try to do research. And I said, well, the number one thing is um, it was illegal. You know, it was kind of out in the open illegal and, you know, everyone knew about it, but still it was illegal. So you weren't really going to write it down. Um, so that's that's the thing. It, it is kind of lost uh, to the ages. Now, having said that, Joyce, I think you need to write it down because um, it, it wouldn't surprise me because otherwise your options were um, you know, people in Geneva were you know making wine and beer, but in terms of you know bourbon or anything that you know tasted halfway decent, you know you couldn't really get that. Right. Right. I. I... I assume it would probably happened at least a few times. So, uh, but people are resourceful when they need to be. Yeah. So, well, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. But I thought it was a great story. No, no, I, I uh, in person, I like to make these things a chat. It just, uh, we have this extra, extra few steps with, uh, with, with Zoom to make that happen. Um, and of course, there is the Seneca Lake Sea Monster, which um, I did not uh, I did not capture the headline, but this is back sometime uh, in the uh, late 1800s when the steamboats were running, and it was extremely pos uh, extremely popular for excursions on a weekend or on a you know special day in the summer. People would just pile on and. Uh, go down and up the lake and uh, and have a great time. And apparently uh, one time on the way back from Watkins Glen, uh, there was a terrible, terrible bump and they, you know, ran into something and supposedly the, uh, the deckhands, you know, got a hold of it and there was this giant serpent and they kind of lashed it to the boat, but lo and behold, it had escaped by the time they got back to Geneva. And what was very popular in the 19th century was that um, newspapers would, you know, particularly from different towns, would uh, uh, make fun of each other, and then it would get reported back, you know. So, a news 
a newspaper in Rochester said, well, you know, obviously they had been visiting some of the wineries and, you know, drinking, uh, you know, you're drinking some of the grapes, uh, you know, around Seneca Lake, which I should add were much fewer than, you know, there are today. But uh, obviously they've been drinking wine all day and, you know, they imagined the whole thing. And so the next week, the Geneva newspaper reported what Rochester said and, you know, this war of words went back and forth. As far as I know, that was the only sighting. But um, then, of course, in the um, you know in the 1990s and the early 2000s, we had the Seneca Lake Whale Watch, uh, which, like the submarines, you know, you always had a few people saying, "Are there really, are there really whales in the lake?" Like, no, it's you know, it's just whimsy. Whimsy is getting harder to sell all the time, I guess. That is about 45 minutes. I don't know if there's any other questions or. Well, co-hostesses, would you like to? Um, oh, how is the bar attached to the bottom? Um, again, this is just from reading some books and websites. Um, it's It's anchored, I assume. Um, I assume it's more cables than actual, you know, steel pylons, but, well, wait, yeah, what are we talking about? We're talking about 600 feet. Um, that's a good question. I would look, I would uh, Google the website, um, and what did I say they're officially uh, called here? The um, uh, Seneca Lake Sonar Test Facility or the Naval Sea Systems Command at Dresden. Um, or if you just Google Seneca Lake, New York, Navy Barge. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. That's a good question. No, I'm not seeing any more questions. So I think um, I'll thank everybody for joining us today. Our next History Sandwiched In is going to be on November Fourth, same time, same place, uh, with city historian Karen Osborne. So hopefully you can join us next month. Thank you, John. I think I learned a little, a little bit. Uh, probably broke some myths for me. Uh, thank you all for <laughs> for joining us, and we hope to see you uh, next month. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Oh, round of applause. <laughs> round of oh, applause thank, you, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Yes, Zoom, Zoom tradition. All right, thanks.